they were celebrating our anniversary. 46 years this congregation has assembled here. Well, not this congregation, but a congregation started here August 5th, 1973. Nine years later, the church was officially organized on August 1st, 1982. And uh, I've had the privilege of being the pastor here now almost 32 years of that 46. You're thinking I became pastor when I was 12, right? <laughs> Just go ahead and think that. But God has really blessed this church. I believe it's because we've always strived to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And our present sermon series uh, is indicative of that aim and purpose. We're looking at, in the Gospel of John, portraits of Christ from John's gallery. And John gives us 21 portraits of the Lord Jesus in his 21 chapters. And in doing so, he's describing to us the person of Christ and also his mission here. If you've been with us, we've already noted he's the Word of God, chapter 1. He's the Son of Man, from chapter 2. The Divine Teacher, chapter 3. The Great Soul Winner, in chapter 4. And the Great Physician, in chapter 5. Today, we're going to give you the bread and water. We're going to talk about Jesus, the bread of heaven, this morning. If you're coming back tonight, Brother Matt's going to preach about Jesus the living water. So you're going to get bread and water today and maybe a taco. Depends on whether you stay or not. But John chapter 6 will be our text this morning. And uh, we're going to read verses 47 through 58. But we're going to go back and look at some other verses here also. But John 6, 47, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness back during the time of Moses and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your father did eat manna and are dead, he that eateth this bread shall live forever. So Jesus is the bread of heaven, the living bread by which we can have eternal life. He's going to perform a miracle in this to illustrate this. Uh, he's, he's trying to show us that he is our deepest need. Amen? Jesus Christ is our deepest need in this life. Somebody said there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person. And it can only be filled by the Lord Jesus. In every heart there's a hidden hunger for this right relationship with God. Folks, that can only come through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God's answer to our deepest need. In chapter 6, we read of Jesus feeding the thousands of people, the multitude that had come. They're, they're tired, they're hungry. There's no McDonald's in sight. So Jesus wants to feed this great multitude of people. Look back at verse 5 in chapter 6. 
So when Jesus lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company uh, uh, come unto him. He says to one of his apostles, Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, to test him. For Jesus knew what he was going to do. He wasn't really seeking information from Philip. He was just giving Philip an opportunity to respond to this need. And of course, Philip said, well, we've got so much money and it's not enough. There's just no way that we could feed all these people. We just need to send them away. But look what Jesus said. He said in verse 10, make the men sit down. In another gospel, he said, give ye them to eat. We're going to feed this great multitude of people. Now, Philip had it all calculated. He knew exactly how much money it would cost to feed this big a crowd. But he left Jesus out of this equation. Do we ever do that? When you're facing a problem and you're looking for a solution, do you get your calculator out and your checkbook and you're starting trying to figure all this out, and yet you don't factor in the Lord Jesus Christ? We do that, don't we? Sometimes we fail to factor in the Lord in our equation. Philip gave the answer any good atheist would give. Right? I mean, he left Jesus out. That's what the atheist does. They try to figure out. They, they try to solve their problems apart from God. And we can be guilty of that. So let's think this morning about Jesus, the bread of heaven. If you want to take notes... First of all, we should seek to multiply the bread. Seek to multiply the bread. See two things here involved. First, Jesus finds a boy that has a lunch. One boy had enough sense to bring his lunch with him. Just enough lunch for a boy. Some fish and, and some biscuits. And Jesus is going to take this boy's lunch and feed this great multitude. But first of all, I want you to see that was transferred to Jesus. The boy transferred his lunch to Jesus that he might use it. He was willing to give his lunch to the Lord. Now he didn't say, well, Jesus, uh, you can have some of it, but not all of it. I, I need some of this for myself. We do that, don't we? Instead of giving everything to the Lord and and just saying it's all at your disposal. We want to give part of it and yet keep part of it to ourselves. But that boy didn't do that, did he? He gave it all. He gave everything he had to the Lord. And that's what we ought to do. Hey, you ought to give all that you are and all that you have to the Lord Jesus. Make it disposable where he can use it. Don't try to hold on to this life. Because when you do that, you're going to lose it. The boy gave it all away, and he went home hungry, didn't he? Poor kid. No, he didn't. He was fed along with everybody else and probably had more to eat than he originally had. He had more. I mean, they had several baskets full of leftovers when all this was done. So Jesus could multiply the bread because it was transferred into his care. Hey, when you give Jesus something, he will receive it. It may just be a, cold, a, a cup of cold water given in his name, but he'll take that and he'll use that. By the way, no gift is too small to give to the Lord. He'll take what you can give and use it to bless others. Mary, remember she broke that box of ointment and poured it out on the Lord Jesus? She gave all she had, didn't she? You know what Jesus said in Mark 14, 8? He just simply said, she had done what she could. There's a lot to that. Are we doing what we can do? Are we doing, I mean, are we allowing the Lord to take all that we have and all that we are 
to use to his honor and glory. By the way, God expects you to do that. Amen. Transfer it to Jesus. And then secondly, it was transformed by Jesus. Hey, don't insult God by saying that he can't use you. God, God specializes in using ordinary people. He loves to do that. He loved to take ordinary people and do extraordinary things with them. He can take a little boy's lunch and feed 5,000 people. Now, by the way, I hope we have enough food today because uh, I cannot multiply uh, the fish tacos or whatever we've got it back there. So I hope that we, all, we brought enough food for everybody. We usually do. He multiplied the bread. It was transferred to him, and then it was transformed by him. Hey, folks, you're never too big for God to use, and you're never too small that God can use you. Matter of fact, he says that. Look over in 1 Corinthians. Apostle Paul spoke of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26. He said, For you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not. To bring to naught things that are. Why does he do this? Look at verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. He likes to use the small, the ordinary, because then he gets the glory. People say, man, God must be in this. I mean, if he can use Dwight West, then God's got to be in this. Because Dwight West doesn't have many talents. Many gifts. So God gets the glory. We don't boast in ourselves. We give all the glory to God. Secondly, we should seek to manifest the bread. The bread is the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to exalt Him and let people know about our Savior. There are several, you know, I didn't use alliteration last Sunday, but I, I'm back with vengeance. You see this? Uh, I want you to see who Jesus is. What kind of bread the Lord Jesus is. First of all, Jesus is spiritual bread. He's spiritual bread. Back in our text in, in John chapter 6 and verses 27 through 29, he, he speaks of this. That he is that spiritual bread from heaven. Now, when he fed the crowd like this, he kind of became a walking cafeteria to these people, didn't he? A lot of them began to follow him because they wanted him to keep feeding their physical flesh. Jesus, like Moses was in his time, feeding the multitude, the, the great crowd that came out of Egypt. Every morning they woke up to find manna from heaven. God provided quail. God provided water. So Jesus now is like Moses to these people. But he wants them to see beyond the temporary things of this world, the meat which perishes, to see what's behind all of this, and that is that Jesus is that spiritual bread that we all need. We need that. We need to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to, to enlarge his kingdom. I've heard people gripe about church, church buildings being built. Some, some church will, will build a beautiful building, and people will say, well, boy, that's a waste. Spending all that money just to build a church building, why don't they take that money and feed the poor with it instead of building these nice auditoriums? Now, they never applied that to the world. They never gripe when a new bank building's built. They don't gripe when a new sports stadium's been built or a new arena. 
They said, well, that's different. That's sound business. We need those things. Folks, listen, our world has this idea that people today, all they need is the food that perishes. You feed the hungry today, tomorrow they're going to be hungry again. Now, I'm not against feeding the poor. But there's some things that are more important and more needful than that. We need to give them that spiritual bread. That's what they need more than anything. That's more important than physical food. You know, some churches and missionaries, they have this, what they, what's called the social gospel. They're just trying to feed the poor and, and uh, provide for their physical needs, and yet they're neglecting their spiritual needs. They're just making the world a better place to go to hell from. Think about that. Hey, there's more to it than that. We need to, we need to share with them the bread of heaven, Jesus Christ. That's what they need more than anything. They, they need something more than soup and soap. They need salvation. Amen. People need the Lord. That'd be a good song, Brother Sam. Why don't you work on that? People need the Lord. You believe that? I'm not against helping them physically, materially, but let's not neglect their spiritual needs. Let's make sure they receive the spiritual bread. Secondly, Jesus is supernatural bread. Jesus only performed miracles to teach. He was not, these were not publicity stunts. He didn't do this just to draw a crowd. He did these miracles to teach. To teach them important spiritual truths. That crowd that followed him, they hoped to be fed physically time and time again. And when they started hearing him teach about his flesh, they need to eat the flesh and drink his blood, that offended them, didn't it? The Bible says in John 6 that some of them continued no more walking with him. They left him. They were offended by what he was saying. Now, we understand that he was teaching this uh, symbolically, not literally. But we need to appropriate the Lord Jesus Christ. The manna of Moses' time pictured Christ, the bread from heaven. Think about it. Compare the manna of Moses and the Lord Jesus. Both came down from God in heaven. The manna lay on the ground as Jesus humbled himself. The manna was white, which spoke of Jesus' purity. It was sweet to the taste as the Lord Jesus is satisfying to us. It had to be gathered as Jesus must be appropriated by us. And it was eaten just as Jesus must be partaken of by us. And it sustained them. The manna sustained them just as Jesus sustains us. Amen. He is that supernatural bread. Hey, bread is for the living, not for the dead. Should we set bread before a corpse? If we had a dead body here, if we could just put some bread in his mouth, would that bring him back to life? That would be wonder bread indeed, amen? They still make wonder bread. It'd be ideal bread. I remember back in Arkansas, they had ideal bread. But all that speaks of the Lord Jesus. He is wonder bread. He is supernatural bread. He's that bread from heaven that brings life to those who appropriate it. Number three, Jesus is satisfying bread. We see that in verses 34 through 35. He is that bread which cometh down from heaven. And they will never again hunger if they feed upon the Lord Jesus. The things of the world really can't satisfy us. You know that? As I said, there's an emptiness in us that only Jesus can fill. What if you went home after, well, we're going to eat here, but... Maybe later tonight, 
you're hungry and you're ready to eat. And what, what if somebody gave you a tape of a sermon to listen to? Or they gave you a CD of gospel music? Would that satisfy your physical hunger? Be like this. Everybody, come on. No. That would not satisfy your physical hunger. The wise Israelite judged that that manna from heaven was just what he needed. It satisfied him. The carnal wanted to go back to Egypt. They, they missed the leeks and garlic and onions. Remember that? They missed that. The food Egypt provided. And Egypt's a picture of the world. And there are those who crave what the world has to offer, but that will never really satisfy you. Some of you, some of you have a hunger for the Word of God. I mean, every time the doors open, you're here. You want to you learn more and more about Jesus. You want to know more about what God has provided for us and what God has promised us. Some of you will be back tonight. At 6 o'clock, you're going to be right back here. You want to hear what Matt's going to have to say about that living water. You've got a hunger for the Word of God. Now, some of you, we don't ever see you on Sunday night. There's other things that are more appealing to you. I don't know if it's TV or going to the movies or sports or some hobby. I don't know what it is. But you don't have that hunger for the Word of God that others seem to have. Number four, Jesus is suitable bread. Some of you are very careful about what you eat. You avoid the junk food. You avoid the, the sweets. You, you, you get that food that's very nutritious, very suitable for your body. Now, that Old Testament manna was perfectly suited for those nomads in the wilderness. It's just what they needed for their nomadic condition. See, God, our Creator... He's an expert on what kind of food is best for us. You know that? Our creator who made us knows what's best for us. That manna was the ideal bread for them back then. Jesus is the ideal bread for the soul. Nothing is more suitable for, for our soul journey. The Bible says we're sojourners, pilgrims in this life. This world's not our home. We're on our way to our heavenly home. And God knows what we need. God knows what is suitable. Deceivers may try to offer us substitutes to lure us away from the Word of God. Hey, let others feed on the leeks and garlics of Egyptian doctrine. We know we just want the Word of God. We want the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, why go back to the husk of Egypt when we can dine at the master's table? Amen? Hey, if you feed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't have any hardening of the spiritual arteries. Your, dis your discernment will not be distorted. You will not be spiritually weak. He is the suitable bread. Number five, he is sustaining bread. You want to live forever? Now, I'm not saying exist forever. Everybody's going to exist forever. Those who go to hell are going to exist forever. Now, you can't call it living, can you? But they will exist forever. Hey, Jesus did not say that if we would come to him, he would give us everlasting existence. He said, I will give you everlasting life, that abundant life that only the Lord can give us. He said, those who ate the manna eventually died. But all who partake of the Lord Jesus will never taste the second death. Hey, I, I'm glad Jesus not only saves us, but he sustains us. He is sustaining us bread he will keep us safe forever number six he is sufficient bread he's all sufficient 
We don't need anything else. We shouldn't desire anything else. Hey, those who have tasted the grace of God really don't want anything else. We find out that Jesus is sweeter. Sweeter as the days go by. They, they delight in hearing more about Jesus. Look at this in 1 first, first Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. It says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Have you tasted of the grace of God? That's sufficient, isn't it? Some people have such a hunger for the Word of God that they don't want to miss any service. They don't want to miss any Bible study. We all should be that way. The seventh thing I want you to see is Jesus is sacramental bread. As I said, the idea of eating Jesus offended a lot of these people. They found this doctrine repulsive, eating flesh and drinking blood. Now, surely they understood Jesus was speaking symbolically when he spoke of this. Yet it was the doctrine of Jesus being the bread of life and really the only way of life that seemed to offend some people, even today. Aren't there a lot of people today that are offended when you say Jesus is the only way to heaven? If you don't know, get out and start talking to some people. Tell them Jesus is the only Savior. He's the only way to heaven. And people will get angry at you. The very idea. They think there's many ways to heaven. The Bible says there's one way. And it's a narrow way. He is that sacramental bread, the bread of life that we need, the only Savior, the only way. And we need to let others know that. Folks, Jesus is not just a good way. He's the only way. People need to understand that. Then number three, we should seek to magnify the bread. You look at verse 27. He said, Labor not for meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. When Jesus told us to hunger and thirst after righteousness, he was saying, I am what you hunger for. I am that righteousness. I am that satisfaction that your soul really needs. Blessed are they which do hunger. Those who hunger for Christ shall be filled. Amen? The lack of satisfaction, the sense of unfulfilled desire that permeates our world is only a symptom of a greater sickness. That's being without God and without hope. Suppose you got sick. You go to a doctor who gives you something to deaden the pain. Now, that's fine as far as it goes. But if he does not deal with the infections causing the pain and the fever, he's not really practicing good medicine, is he? We need something more than just killing the pain. That's what the world offers us. The drugs, the alcohol, all these things, all that does is deaden the pain. It doesn't solve the problem. Are you with me? That's what the world is doing. And they neglect the very thing they need most, and that is they need the Lord Jesus Christ in their life. You'll never be satisfied. Until you have the Lord Jesus in your life. Hey, you can go deeper into Jesus. But you can never go beyond Jesus. You hear me? We want to go deeper and deeper. We, we want to learn all we can. But folks, you cannot go beyond Jesus. 
There's nothing beyond him. He is all that we need. Seek him, secondly, seek him purposefully. Seek Jesus purposefully. Verse 27 says that we're to labor for things that endure forever. Labor for it. Be diligent about this. Hey, God does business with those who mean business, right? Some people will go away spiritually hungry because they really have no appetite for Jesus. A truly hungry person will do just about anything. If he's starving, he'll do about anything for food, right? He doesn't care about the Super Bowl. He doesn't care about the World Series or anything else. He just wants food. Suppose you prepared a feast for a guest. He sits down at your table, but he won't eat. You've got before him just a plate full of really wonderful food, and he refuses to eat it. You say, what's the problem? He said, well... I hate to bring this up, but my plate is chipped. I can't eat off a chip plate. And and by the way, the parsley is on the wrong side. And and I hate to say this, there's a spot in the tablecloth. I just can't eat. Now, you know right away that he's not very hungry. A hungry person does not quibble about trivial things. Amen. Yet people will go to church and quibble over every little thing. Come on. They criticize this. They quarrel about that. They don't like the song selection. They think the preacher's dull. Hey, if you hunger for the Word of God... You're not here looking for fault. At least I hope you're not. I mean, if you're looking for fault, you're going to find it. But if you come here to feast upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll find him here. Then number three, seek Jesus perpetually. It says in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never again hunger. What does he mean by that? He's not saying that you can come to one church service and and be fed and never have to come back. What he's saying is every time you're hungry, he will feed you. Your hunger will never go unsatisfied. Jesus gives you a continual appetite and continual satisfaction for your appetite. If you don't have an appetite, you're either sick, dead, or fed. Right? You know, during the holidays, when many of us really feast, and people will sit down about three inches from the table and eat until they're touching the table. Right? They get up and say, man, I am stuffed. I could not eat another bite. They are totally satisfied. But what happens about five or six hours later, they got their head stuck in the fridge looking for that leftover drumstick. What happened? Their appetite returned. Amen? But Jesus says, he promises that He will give you a continual appetite and continual satisfaction. Some of y'all are going to get hungry about 6 o'clock for this spiritual bread, and you're going to be back. Sticking your head in the fridge, looking for what Matt's going to feed you. Why? Because you've got a good appetite. Come on. Are you with me? Some of you got a good appetite. A continual appetite. You want more and more, and you are being fed every time you come. 
God gives us a continual appetite for spiritual things so we can just keep feasting on Jesus. Now let me ask you, have you received the bread of life? Do you understand what we're talking about? That Jesus is that bread of life, that bread from heaven. If you will just feast on him, if you will appropriate him into your life, he will save you. He will give you eternal life. You know, if a person's starving, and instead of eating, he wants to study the theory of nutrition, he becomes an expert on food, and yet dies of hunger because he won't eat. Listen, some of you have come and listened to the gospel. You've been doing it for years. But listening will not save you. Come on. Just hearing about food won't fill your belly. Just hearing the gospel, if you do not appropriate the gospel and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as the bread of life, you will not be saved. You understand me? You've got to believe on Jesus Christ. Trust in Him as your Lord and Savior. Ask Him to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior, and He will. He's standing at the door knocking this morning. At your heart's door, you've got an opportunity today to invite Him to come in and be your Lord and Savior.